I'm Elliot Gerson, uh, Executive Vice President of the Aspen Institute. Um, absolutely thrilled to see such an amazing audience tonight uh, for the launch of our Winter Words season. Uh, you know, it's a uh, special thanks uh, and special appreciation to the Advisory Council uh, for Aspen Words, members of the National Council, uh, all other members, and of course, all of you who are here because you either love literature uh, or you love amazing climbing uh, or you just enjoy the kinds of programs that Aspen Words uh, puts on during the winter and the summer as well. This is the 22nd season of Winter Words, uh, our annual author series that celebrates the best of contemporary literature. This year brings seven great writers at the height of their careers to five different events over the course of the ski season. Uh, from tonight's memoirist and rock climber extraordinaire to Pulitzer and other prize winners, uh, leading thinkers, journalists, bestsellers, it's gonna be an absolutely amazing season. Uh, I bring the best wishes of Adrian Brodeur, who couldn't be here tonight, who directs Aspen Words. Uh, and again, let me just give a special thanks uh, to the National Council and the Advisory Board uh, for working with such conscientiousness and such dedication uh, to provide such a vibrant home for outstanding literature in the Roaring Fork Valley. Uh, with that, it's my great pleasure to bring up uh, Carolyn Torrey, Program Manager of Aspen Words, who is going to tell you about this evening's program. Thank you very much. Good evening. On behalf of the whole Aspen Words team, thank you all for being here and welcome to Winter Words. Um, I have several people to thank tonight. Our season is only possible thanks to a number of partners and sponsors. Um, our season presenting sponsors, Beth and Josh Mondry and Helen and Wally Obermeyer. Our media partner, Aspen Sojourner, thank you for co-hosting tonight's membership reception at the Opera Gallery. If you're interested in learning about membership, talk to any one of our staff after the event um, out in the lobby. Um, also, media partners, the Aspen Times, Aspen Public Radio, and Aspen 82. Our lodging sponsors are the Gantt, Frias, and Aspen Alps. And our grantors, thank you to the City of Aspen, Les Dames d'Aspen, and the Thrift Shop of Aspen. Finally, thank you to Aspen Snowmass and Four Mountain Sports for helping get all of our Winter Words authors out on the slopes, and to Asbarian Red Company. Just join me in a quick round of applause for our sponsors. <laughs> After the talk, Explore Booksellers will be out in the lobby um, selling copies of Tommy Caldwell's book, The Push as well as Penn Newhard's 50 Classic Ski Descents of North America. And Tommy will be around to sign copies, um, but we ask for your cooperation in helping to keep that book signing line moving along quickly because we have a hard stop at 7.25. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Penn Newhard, who many of you will know from the local crags and the ski hill. Penn left his job as a Wall Street municipal bond trader in 1989 to relocate to Aspen, which eventually led to a post as advertising director of Climbing Magazine. An accomplished mountaineer and father of four, Penn has skied or climbed on every continent except for Australia. He is the founder of Backbone Media, a Carbondale-based PR and media agency representing brands in the outdoor space. Please join me in welcoming Penn Newhart and Tommy Caldwell to the Winter Word stage. Okay, uh, is that working for everyone in terms of the mic? Yeah, Tommy? Yeah, testing, testing. <laughs> Good to go. Great, so um, as Carolyn said, 
Uh, my name is Penn Newhart. I will be guiding this conversation here tonight with Tommy. Uh, before we start, I do want to thank Aspen Words again. Uh, thanks for bringing Tommy out and for uh, all of you here tonight. See a lot of familiar uh, family and friends out here, so it's great. Um, so one thing I will say is, uh, as a climber myself, I, there are basically three types of climbing literature. There are, there's mediocre climbing literature, which is, it, that is abundant. And then there's a lot of uh, climbing literature that is basically only interesting to climbers and skier types. It's for the, the, like the high geek threshold, getting into the details. And then beyond that, every once in a while a book comes along and it's just like, it, it's, it's, it, it goes deep into that endemic side of that to the core group, but then it's also expansive and it's much more appealing to the broader base. And that's exactly what the push is from Tommy. Um, unbelievable book. And as they said, you can get a copy outside, but wonderful book. Congratulations, Tommy, on that. So um, before we get started here, uh, we are going to roll a trailer to a film. Um, so beyond being a great writer, uh, Tommy has been in two major films this past fall, one being The Dawn Wall, and then um, the second was a film by uh, Jimmy Chin about Alex Honnold, who actually free solos El Capitan in, in Yosemite. And, um, and Tommy plays a very prominent role in that as well. So before we get started and jump into that, we're going to roll a trailer here, and then uh, we'll get started with the conversation. Hello? Hey guys, it's John Branch from the New York Times. How's it going up there? Good, John. Good to hear from you, man. Uh, Tommy, why are you doing this? What's, what's the point of all this? Climbing was kind of like the first thing in my life where I could stand out a little bit. Tommy became known as one of the best young climbers. He was super ambitious. And I met this girl who was an amazingly talented climber. It just clicked. <laughs> yeah, I was like, whoa. We got invited to go on this expedition to Kyrgyzstan. It just felt like kind of a dream come true. We wake up with these piercing close gunshots. Rebels start marching us on a six-day journey through the mountains. Four young Americans abducted by rebels confront a life-or-death choice to kill or be killed. Ever since Kyrgyzstan, I just have this fire in me that is different than anything I've had before. We've been following two climbers. Tommy Caldwell and Kevin Jorgensen. Making a historic climb up the side of Yosemite's El Capitan. Will it pay off? If Tommy and Kevin can do it, it would be the most continuously difficult rock climb in the world. Day one. Nothing else is even close to it. This was always Tommy's dream. He's put so much of his life into it. You failed on this thing like 800 times. Give it up. <laughs> Where are the lines between dedication an obsession. Why am I doing this? How can you continue to beat your head against this wall? It's going to be now or it's going to be never. I want this for him so badly. Kevin Jorgensen is stuck. What happens if he doesn't make it? Do you say, you go ahead without me? Do you leave a guy behind? Early in the morning, there's this one panel of the wall that illuminates first. And that's why it's called the Dawn Wall. So, Tommy, Happy New Year. Do you have a New Year's resolution? <laughs> uh, to try not to get obsessed by anything too much this year so that I can focus, uh, except for my family, of course. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I spend a lot of time with them. Um, but I wanted to say one thing really quick. Um, f uh, I really feel honored to be here tonight. Penn, thank you so much for um, 
uh, you know, recommending me to Aspen Words. I do a lot of events every year. This one seems to somehow make me feel like a bit of an imposter because of the prestige surrounding this place. It was funny. I still don't see myself as an author. So walking up to this building and seeing my picture with uh, memoirs below it made me snicker a bit. But uh, it really is a, it really is an honor, and it's so great to be here. Thanks. So. Uh, yeah, we'll try to get through this without superlatives, so I won't call you a, a memorist, and we'll just go from there. As you saw in the trailer, uh, Tommy had an unbelievable climb on the Dawn Wall, and it is considered, well, if we're not using superlatives, a pretty darn hard climb, and he's actually an okay climber. Um, but so, in, in, in terms of this, uh, we'll start on the films, and then we'll get to the book in a little bit, but you had... You've climbed more free climbs on El Cap than anyone else. And for the Dawn Wall, it was an eight-year love affair. Can you unpack that a little bit and talk about what drives someone to try to climb something over the course of eight years? Um, I mean, I think I just sort of happened into it. I mean, I, I, I fell in love with El Cap. I got completely obsessed. Um, I was pretty poor at most things in life. And it turns out that uh, I was sort of good at climbing on El Cap. And so if you find that one thing that you're really good at, you, you kind of can't stop. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I went and I spent about 15 years trying to repeat all the existing free routes and then, and then doing a bunch of my own. And then I got to this place where I wanted to really, you know, figure out what I was capable of. And I think that was an outgrowth of other things that had happened in my life. But I wanted to... Uh, I just had some questions that needed to be answered, and so it started out uh, sort of in a place of curiosity, um, and then it and then it turned into this total love affair with the with the process of being there, and so that's what brought me there year after year. Like the idea of not going and working on the Don Wall each year um, made me sad, so I kept going back. So, backing up a little bit though, you said that you weren't really good at anything when you started out, and um, in the book it talks about you like like not really walking for a little while and kind of developmentally being, you know, kind of taking your time. Um, but I mean, what is, what is it like to, to all of a sudden find that, that thing that really gets you excited and start to pursue that? Because I mean, as we were talking earlier, it's like when you found climbing, everything just kind of started to click. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, it really is true. And I think, I mean, I think you, anything in life kind of needs both sides of the equation. And since I, you know, I was severely premature, I was uh, mentally super slow as a child, and so I didn't feel like I was good at anything. But yet I had this father who was, you know, such a man and so much about, like, excellence and prestige. And so um, I, I felt like I lacked. And then when I found climbing, because he introduced it to me, all of a sudden I had something that at first I think I did it because you know, my, you know, I saw that it brought him joy, but at some point it really, it started to build confidence in, in me. And so when I, when I realized that I was good at it, it was a very magical um, part of my life. And so I think that's made it easy to be so singularly focused and, and stick with it in the way that I have. Yeah. And so tell us about the hole in the backyard of your house at Estes Park. You like were digging a hole in the rocks. And that was kind of in when you were like six, seven, eight-ish, or is that is that the story? Yeah, I think this is actually the first uh, the first story in this in my book is uh, is a story of me being uh, actually like three to four years old was the time period, and I decided I was going to dig a hole to China, and I <laughs> and there was the the ground in Estes Park, Colorado. There's not really dirt per se. It's like decomposing granite and so I would get out there with the with at first a shovel and just like ding, 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 for like hours a day and um, eventually I got a pick and I started using that and after you know a year I'd managed to dig about a three foot hole and I don't I think I decided to start the book that way is because I was I was odd as a child and that has led to some <laughs> led to some great things in my life so yeah Odd but determined. Yeah, I like that. Um, but so when so you climbed all these routes on El Cap, and then you decided to project the Dawn Wall, and in the book it, it talks and in the film it talks about it going over eight years. Can you talk about the partnerships? I mean, were people starting to question? I mean, obviously you had the resolve, just as you demonstrated as in your work release program at age four. Um, but uh, what? Like, what was that like trying to, to find partners? Because that's a, that's a big ask. 
right? To get someone to go up there with you? Yeah, I mean, the resolve part is funny because I think that digging a hole to China as in climbing the Dawn Wall wasn't for me so much about accomplishing that goal in the end. It was, it was more about like I got addicted to the process. And you're right, it is hard to convince other people to uh, come along <laughs> you know, to accompany you on a project like that because most people who join something like that are really going to be looking at it in terms of like what, what, what can we accomplish because it takes a lot of work, a ton of work. Um, and so, you know, honestly, for the first year, I didn't think that there was any chance I would find a partner. So I just went up there alone and I would swing around and I'd camp up there. I spent uh, many weeks up on the side of El Cap all alone. And, um, and it was, in some ways, it, it fulfilled that same sort of thing that digging the hole did. I think I liked the methodical nature of being outside and kind of like working towards something. I liked working hard. Um, but uh, but I didn't think uh, anybody else would want to do that. So Kevin Jorgensen, who ended up being my partner, um, he just called me one day and and he said he wanted to accompany me, and I was feeling kind of lonely. Um, and uh, and I was like, sure, you can come and give it a shot. And I never really thought he'd stick around, and he did. And and so without giving away too much of the story, though, uh, Tommy and Kevin start climbing the you know this this route, which is considered one of the continuously hardest routes in the world. And um, Tommy ha starts having success through this one really difficult bit. And, and Kevin is struggling on that part. And at this point, uh, the New York Times has caught wind of this and the media is kind of gaining momentum on the story. And it seemed to me, well, you were doing the interview in, in the trailer with John Branch from the New York Times. Is it true that you actually chucked your phone off the portal edge, or was it it was it truly dropped, or was it kind of semi accidental? Uh, it was accidental, but I'll, but to give you a little context there, so we worked on the route for seven years. Actually, I worked on the route for seven years, and then our goal at the end was to, after we had figured it all out, to go back to the beginning and do a continuous push, and that ended up taking 19 days. And during those 19 days was when. Um, you know, when the story kind of went viral in the media, which was completely unexpected and unplanned. But so as you're having success and going across and Kevin is struggling, can you talk about the partnership there and, 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 and the friendship that you forged? Because I think a lot of people here who do stuff in the mountains realize that, yeah, there's the element of going on the adventure, but it's really the shared experience that really is the test of time. So can you expound upon that relationship with Kevin and was it hard for you um, because success was fairly you know I mean after you, you got through those middle pitches it seemed fairly close but you were you know very determined to wait for Kevin so can you can you talk about that yeah you know the relationship with Kevin is is a fascinating one to me because I think most of the real strong climbing relationships that I've had in my life are, um, you know, those those people that you're close with become people that you you become quite vulnerable with. You like, you talk to them about your relationship issues. You um, you reveal a lot. Like I think when you do something scary with somebody, it creates this vulnerability that bonds you very closely. And so that's one of the main reasons I climb is because we crave that that brotherhood or that sisterhood. Um, Kevin was different. It was it was never like that. Actually, um, he he wasn't willing to be vulnerable. He's kind of a, of a bit of a different generation. Um, you know, I went through a divorce when I was climbing on the Don Wall with him. He went through a major breakup. We, we didn't talk about that stuff. It was it was it was really quite strange in a lot of ways. But there was this um, sort of this underlying ideal that climbing is more about that personal relationship um, than it is about the comp accomplishment of it. And, you know, for me, it seemed pretty obvious, like the right thing to do is to wait, wait for your partner. You don't, you know, you don't leave your, you don't you leave your brother laying down in the field. Um, and so I think in my book, I didn't really even dive too deeply into this topic, but the movie really brought it out. And I think it's, it's one of those things that it's almost easier for outsiders. It's more shocking for outsiders to, um, to look at that and see that as unique than it than it was for me, but um, you know people like to talk about it. I think it's the highlight of the movie in a lot of ways, and um, 
and it makes me appreciate <laughs> appreciate it more. It's funny sometimes you need an outside perspective. So f for the people here, can you talk about? I mean, give them an idea of just how hard some of those middle pitches were. I mean, there I, I forget whether it's in the f the film or the book or both. But at one point, you built your training wall, your Woody at home in Estes Park, to simulate some of the moves. Um, I mean, can you give them an idea of the exposure and and the gear and some of the falls that you were taking, um, just to give them a little bit of context, and then w then we'll move off of the Dawn Wall for a little bit. Yeah. Um. I think one of the things that that fascinates me the most in life um, is taking something and breaking it down to the smallest little bits that it can be broken down to, and dissecting those and analyzing them. I must be a bit of a scientist at heart. And so one thing that I loved about the Dawn Wall is that it was so hard for me that it had to be climbed exactly perfectly. Um, so on the hard sections, which is the traverse that you talked about. Um, we had to analyze every detail of every body movement. You know, really closely think about the angle that our f that the rubber on our shoes was contacting the surface of the rock, the temperature. Um, you know, we would take sandpaper and sand um, razor blades and kind of shape the edge of our shoes. Um, we changed our diet. We would f we would eat things that would kind of fuel our skin from the inside out. I invented a new shoe. A, a company that I worked with invented a skin cream to to um, increase blood flow, to, um, to make it so we would heal faster. Um, the, the hardest move I did, I rebuilt on the side of my storage shed. I brought a tape measure up on the side of El Cap, and I measured out all the holds and took pictures of them and measured. The, I downloaded an app on my phone that I could measure angles and I mapped it all out as exactly as I could and rebuilt it at home so I could um, try it at my house. And I literally tried it probably tens of thousands of times uh, in the off season. And so breaking it down to that level was absolutely fascinating to me. And, um, and then there's the element of trying to overcome the, you know, the sort of guttural fe fear that you <laughs> have up there. You, you talked about the falls. The, you know, we were climbing on a lot of terrain where the, the protection is quite bad. Um, so, you, you know, as you lead climb, you clip yourself in every few feet to different pieces of climbing protection. Um, some of them are quite good. Some of them are bad. So sometimes when you fall, they just ping out of the wall. And so each time a piece of protection falls, you fall farther and farther. And that's pretty scary. And so it's hard to, you know, sometimes we'd fall up to 100 feet, I would say. But if you climb with that thought in your mind that you're going to climb 100 feet, there's no way you can focus on all the little details that you're trying to memorize. Um, so we had to spend a lot of time just trying to get ourselves to focus and gain trust in the gear. At one point, we decided to go to the top of El Cap and just tie into the end of a rope and tie the other end into an anchor point, like uh, like 50 feet away from us, and just leap off the top of El Cap and take this 200 foot free fall. And um, my idea was that we were never going to probably take a 200 foot fall up there. So if I had experienced that, then I wouldn't be thinking so much about it. That plan kind of backfired. <laughs> I, rem I remember after that, every time I'd be above my gear, I'd remember that sensation of my f stomach falling out and the wall whipping by really fast and the wind in my ears. Um, so, yeah, anyways. Yeah, I, I, you might have overthought that one a little bit, yeah. Um, and also, in, in you, you climbed at night for better temperature and better friction. So, you know, then when you do fall off, it's just like you just plummet into the darkness. I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, we, it's funny. We started climbing. When we, the first season that we went up on the Dawn Wall, we started in September, and it was too hot. So the next year, we kind of pushed the meat of the season back to October, and then November, and then December, and then we started climbing at night. And we just realized that the colder, the better, really. It needed to be dry, but it need, you know, the, the rubber on your shoes is a bit harder, and your skin is a bit harder when it's cold. So we'd be climbing in pretty bitterly cold conditions, um, and that seemed to work the best. But climbing, you know, 2,000 feet off the ground in the middle of the night when it's windy and super gnarly out is pretty scary. <laughs> um, but after a while, you start to get used to it, and I started to feel like we, we'd bring these big lights up there, and I started to feel like the comfort of that bubble of light was a little bit like sitting around a campfire, you, start, you stopped thinking about the ground. Um, it made it feel more intimate, and I actually really enjoyed the nighttime climbing in the end. Yeah. Great. So um, switching over, 
there was another film out this fall. Um, as I said, it was about Alex Honnold, who's a very good friend of yours. And uh, he ended up on the left side. The Dawn Wall is on the right side of El Cap. As you look at it, the left side is um, Free Rider, and that's the route that Alex free soloed, so climbed it completely without a rope. And throughout the film, Tommy is in that, and you, you know, can you just give a little insight to the crowd as to, I mean, in the film, you talk about how nuts this whole thing was for Alex to even attempt this or consider it. And can you just expound upon that a little bit or, get, or give some personal insight? I mean, knowing Alex so well and knowing Al Cap so well, what's it like for someone to, the audacity of that, to try that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, maybe it's worth explaining for a second the difference between the Don Wall and Alex's climb. The Don Wall is, you know, the, the hardest physical climb on El Cap, but it's not, you know, all that dangerous. Um, Alex's free solo of the free rider is, you know, arguably the most dangerous athletic feat of all time, <laughs> I would say. And even though the climbing is much easier, it's like you can't fall. We, you know, I fell tens of thousands of times on the Don Wall. Alex, when he free solos El Cap, if he falls once, he dies. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and he's one of my best friends. So I spent a year kind of in and around his scene um, of making the movie and helping him prepare and being stressed out by the whole thing, unbelievably. And um, on one hand, I feel like I, I knew that he needed this in his life, and so I wanted to up his chance of survival as much as possible, and that's why I was there for him as a friend. Um, but I didn't want him to do it. <laughs> and so I think that, I guess in that, if you, that, that movie, that comes across a bit. I'm like, the, I'm, I'm kind of the sane one, <laughs> maybe. Just make, making him question his life choices a little bit. Do you think that having done that, will he continue on, on a similar path? Or, I mean, is that a pinnacle achievement for him? Will it be easy for him to back off that? Or uh, I mean, I think Alex is... He's, he's got to be one of the most, I mean, he's a true outlier. He's both physically and psychologically, he is, he is just different than anybody else. And he's incredibly smart. And I do think that he understands that that is not a path towards survival. Like if he kept uh, pursuing goals like that, he would not live. Um, and I think he's smart enough to see that. And so I do think he's going to back off. Yeah. So um, switching more towards the book now, um, we, we touched on your childhood and digging the hole. And we touched on your father, who was a very positive influence on you. And so the first climbing competition, basically, that you ever entered was at Snowbird, or the first major one. And you ended up being kind of uh, like a dark horse, last minute kind of, oh, we'll put Tommy in against all the best climbers in the world. And then you won that. Is that, is that how that went down? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I was just on a summertime road trip with my dad. I kind of climbed as a child because that's what we did as a family. I didn't know anything different. There weren't other kids climbing at that, you know, back then. I'd go to places like Rifle. Rifle, Colorado is one of our favorite places to go. And, um, and you know, there was just really nobody to compare myself to. So when I entered that comp competition at Snowbird, um, I just didn't know that I was good. <laughs> and so when I when I won it, and I knew that there was other people there that were, you know, experienced and some of the best climbers in the U.S., um, that was that was sort of a illuminating moment. I was like, wow, I could actually like pursue this and make a life of it. And uh, yeah, so it, it it completely changed my life because I was like climbing as a hobby, and after that, I was climbing as like that's all I thought about. Right. So you at, at that point there truly weren't really that many professional climbers in the world. I mean, there were a handful of Europeans, but so it was kind of an uncharted territory for you. Yeah, and, and in the world of rock climbing, being a professional climber probably meant uh, from sponsorship and competition winnings combined, you'd make like $50 a month. Yeah, <laughs> so not, not much of a profession. Yeah. yeah, so that's why you still part-time live in the van. Just, right. yeah. <laughs> um, but so once you became sponsored, you ended up going over to uh, Kyrgyzstan, to the Aksu area. And it's in the trailer, you guys go up on a wall, you and at that point, it's your girlfriend, right, Beth? And, and two other friends. And uh, all of a sudden, terrorists show up, start shooting at you. And, and can you 
talk a little bit about, well, number one, what's it like to be kidnapped? And then what's it like to be unkidnapped? <laughs> wow, this could take a while. I'll try and <laughs> condense it. Um, yeah, that trip was, um, I don't know, I guess I, th I think of my life in terms of like what led up to that trip to Kyrgyzstan and what happened since. Like it was intense in a way that changed me forever. And I was a, prof you know, I wasn't really a professional climber. I had one snowbird at that point, um, but I was like a, you know, I was a sport climber, a competition climber. I, I weaseled my way onto this trip in Kyrgyzstan as just the boyfriend to Beth, who was actually a North Face sponsored athlete. And then we flew into this remote mountain valley and found ourselves in the middle of this war. Um, our kidnapping happened because this, this rebel group called the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan found out that we were climbing up this valley. They came up the valley with their long range assault rifles. They shot up to us when we were sleeping on portal edges a thousand feet up the wall. And we came down and we were and we were captured as this kind of war broke out around us between the Islamic movement, Uzbekistan and the Kyrgyz military. And we were hostages of the rebels. And we spent six days sort of fleeing with the rebels, had to abandon all of our food and warm clothing. Um, we we watched a Kyrgyz soldier who was also a captive um, alongside of us get shot point blank in the head. Uh, had to sit on his body for like four hours as these mortars and you know it's just like a full-on war and all the grimness that war is and um, and so you know that kind of experience has the has the ch I think it has the uh, potential to do one of two things it can traumatize you forever in a way that makes it hard to function in life which it definitely had the potential to do that but it can also illuminate certain things and um, you know, I would say probably I credit my dad's approach to me, um, to, to raising me, to sort of like preparing me for that moment, because climbing really is like, you know, what he did with me as a child is he, is he uh, exposed me to like minorly traumatizing experiences on a slightly increasing basis <laughs> over and over again. And so by the time I got kidnapped, I was kind of preparing, you know, I was kind of ready for it in a, in a weird way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. my, I have two daughters here in the audience. I just wanted to footnote that traumatizing thing just for you guys. Um, but so you're trekking around, no food, cold nights. You're with your girlfriend and two other friends. And then an opportunity arises for you to push the one captor who was in charge of you guys off a cliff. Was, I mean, was that just like dead obvious to you? Like, okay. This is going to end badly. It, this is the way it is. I mean, can you can you talk about that a little bit in terms of the mentality or where your head was at there? Um, I mean, I would say early in our in our kidnapping, it became pretty obvious that in certain ways we as the climbing team had the upper hand. We were used to this mountain environment. We had. Um, like these lightweight, sticky rubber um, approach shoes on. We weren't carrying a big heavy gun. Our captives were in, you know, these slick shoes with big army fatigues and these, and these big guns that they were carrying. And so it became pretty obvious that we could potentially flee the whole situation. Um, but the easiest way to do that without getting shot would be to find a way to overcome our captors. And at first there was four, two of them disappeared. We were left with two at the end um, for most of those six days. And um, and so Jason Singer, the guy who organized the 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 whole trip in the first place, he was kind of the leader of our expedition. He very adamantly thought that we needed to find a way to overcome our captors, and so he talked for days. I was, you know, during the nighttime hour or during the daylight hours, we would actually be hiding in these small boulders under the ground, and he would just talk incessantly about, you know, grabbing their jugular veins and. Um, you know, getting their guns and shooting them in the head in these really gory ways. And I was like, this is evil. This is not something that we want to be part of. Like, I was adamantly against actually taking matters into our own hands. Until the sixth night when we were left with just one captor because the, uh, the leader of the rebel group decided to go back to our base camp to try and get food. And we were going to climb this really steep 2,000-foot mountainside. Um, rain was in the air, and we were already on the verge of hypothermia, so I was pretty certain that if a storm really came in, we wouldn't survive. And it was just dead obvious that it was, it was going to be easy because we found ourselves in this very exposed terrain. We were comfortable as climbers. He was actually asking us where to go. We were pointing out handholds and footholds. We were boosting him up over the steep sections. Um, and so 
Yeah, I mean, it's like in, in one way, it was it was really obvious that that was our way to escape, but it's not an easy thing to do, you know? <laughs> like deciding to take the life of another person is not an easy thing to do. So Jason, who had been so adamantly against this, he found himself unable to do it. And so I waited until the last possible moment. I waited until we were just about to top out the mountain. And um, I just decided it was the right thing. And that was our only chance of survival. So yeah, I ran up behind him. I grabbed his gun strap and pulled him off the side of the mountain and watched him fall in darkness. Um, he kind of fell 50 feet, bounced off a ledge, and fell out of sight. And so, I mean, that's an amazing story, and, and I can only imagine the internal struggle there as a pacifist and, you know, peaceful person. Uh, it turned out that he actually ended up surviving, and years later, or sometime later, you found out that he is still alive. Is that a myth, or is... No, that's true. Yeah, he, uh, he, he, he must have landed on a ledge down there somewhere. We came back from Kyrgyzstan, um, and I think it was about four months later, a reporter um, found out that he was alive and at first we we're like this is this is not the case like that this reporter is just making up stuff to try and get to us but then they produced a photo of him in prison and in fact he had survived so wow, have you ever had contact or facebook friends any <laughs> No, uh, the, although there was a, there was a, there's been two books where Kyrgyzstan was a pretty major theme. The mm -hmm. first one was called Over the Edge, written by Greg Child, mm -hmm. and during the research of that book, he, along with Jason Singer and John Dickey, went to Kyrgyzstan and interviewed um, Sharapov, was his name, interviewed him in prison. Wow. Um, so again, switching a little bit, uh, you had an accident, and if you can hold up your left hand, just show people here. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we were playing the thing about not being superlative. I think I'm safe to say that he might not be the best carpenter in the world, <laughs> although he is quite a, a good carpenter. But um, can you talk about the accident and just the physical limitations and then you know dealing with injury and recovery and how you look at that moving forward as, you know, as a climber who relies on their fingers? Yeah, Alex Honnold likes to call me the best handicap climber in the world. So <laughs> I don't think that's totally fair because I'm only missing a tiny digit. But um, you know, it, you know, I think losing a finger as a climber, as I once knew it, was a career-ending injury. You know, at least I feared that. Um, but I had sort of made this life of confronting, or I guess maybe my reaction to hardship was to use that experience to help me grow or sort of like move me in some direction. And so when I chopped off my finger, I think I, you know, all I could think about in that part of my life was rock climbing. I wanted to be a better rock climber. I had all these opportunities in front of me and I wanted to pursue them. And, you know, I was right on the verge. I was making like, you know, $48 a month as a climber. I could see a career there, you know? <laughs> and so that's what I wanted. Um, and then I lost it, and I was like, oh, this could be, this could be game over. But um, my girlfriend at the time, Beth, she, you know, there was, this really, there was this really impactful moment in the hospital where my doctor, who was actually a climber, came in, and he sat me down after about two weeks of surgery. Different thing, I went through three surgeries as they tried to reattach the finger, and he came in, and he said, we've tried everything we can. We're going to lose your finger. You're going to lose your finger. We have, we have to remove it for good. And... Um, and then he said, you, you should think about what else you want to do in your life because you're not going to be able to be a professional climber. And I think, I think he was just kind of like vocalizing my fear at the time. And, um, and so I listened to him, and then he got up and left the room. And Beth turned to me, and she's like, fuck that guy. <laughs> 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 he doesn't know what he's talking about. And so I... Uh, yeah, I kind of held on to that, and I ran with it, and that was the right thing to say, for sure. And, and so, yeah, I came back from that experience with this, like, I trained very methodically. I really, I kind of doubled down. I, f I focused more. I started analyzing things in a way that kind of turned into the dawn wall. Like, I analyzed everything about how I climbed and what I did. I also shifted more towards adventure climbing. I could have gone more towards competition and sport climbing, but on one level, I knew I could never probably reach my full potential with only nine fingers in that realm. So it, it kind of put me in the, in, the, in the world that I ended up excelling at anyway. So it was a good, it was a blessing in the end. Yeah, fantastic. So you talk about the hardship and you've talked a little bit about suffering. So where I want to spend the last few minutes is, um, I mean, 
you, you basically dropped out of high school to become a climber, and you, you did squeak through, as you said, it finally. But uh, the art of suffering, a lot of writers talk about you know, going into the pain cave and, and how difficult writing is. Um, do you see comparisons between the effort and sustained effort and suffering that you put into the physical that you um, had to go through in order to write the book, The Push? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that I need the pain. Um, and so uh, when I decided to write this book, the first thing I did is I called up uh, my good friends, Jim Collins, who's a really good business writer, and John Krakauer, who has written great adventure books, and um, or I guess all sorts of interesting books. But anyways, I, sat, I, I, I had the chance to sit down with them, and I remember um, Jim first lamenting about the writing pl process. He's like, you gotta, he's like, usually in the final stages of writing a book, I, I get like boils on my lips and I lose like 20 pounds. <laughs> and then John Krakauer was like, you just gotta think of it like ditch digging. You gotta get in that ditch and you gotta dig like three feet every day, no matter if you're feeling it or not. And I was like, man, I've been digging ditches my whole life. I can write a book. <laughs> and so they had, that, that appealed to me. And so anything, that is good about this book kind of came out of that mentality. I spent 30 to 40 hours a week for a year behind my computer, totally obsessing about trying to make this book as good as I could. I gathered a team, much the way you do in climbing, of um, you know experts to help me do it. And it was really, uh, yeah, it was just about working really hard. Regarding that, there's a quote, I believe it's in the epilogue, that um, reads, I always thought my deepest fulfillment came from the mountains, and that's where, and that's why climbing has been my art. But as I wrote this book, I was surprised to find that the act of creating, even behind a keyboard, or when speaking to an audience, feels deeply rewarding. Maybe all along the appeal has lain in the satisfaction of giving fully of myself. Maybe climbing wasn't always the answer, but the venue. Uh, so we have just a couple more minutes, and then we're going to turn it over to about 15 minutes of questions and answers. Um, before we do that, uh, just two quick questions here. Uh, who inspires you now? Oh man, I find inspiration. I mean, I think the world of writing is is kind of new to me and fresh and really exciting. I'm, I'm a little bit of a jaded climber at this point, so I think climbers inspire me a little bit less. But these days, it's more like good writers like John Krakauer. You know, since I and since I know that guy, and I did a lot of, I found a lot of inspiration in his writing. Um, and um, I don't know, like scientists, like. Um, you know, climate change scientists and um, politicians that I admire. I mean, I find heroes in that realm um, more than I do more than I do in climbing these days. Great. And then, in terms yeah. of going back to climbing, are there some future projects out there that you're eyeing or would care to share with the group here? I mean, I can't. I kind of can't stop going back to El Cap. Weirdly, it's just like I'm so addicted to it, and it turns out it's a really good. Um, formula with my family like they love living in the campground in Yosemite and so we'll go there and we'll spend two to three months a year with my kids running around in the in the big ma magnificent trees and kind of experiencing Yosemite the same way I did when I was a little kid and then I get to escape up onto the walls and so yeah I have another project near the near the Don wall that I've been sort of dabbling on is you know as much as I can I haven't decided to fully focus yet because I know once I do it will it will demand a lot of me um, but yeah, I mean, I, I still am, I still am out there. Like climbing's my food. I have to continue to do it as much as possible. Sure. And then last thing, um, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, do you think you'll take on another ma major writing project in the future at some point? Yeah, I mean, I think I will someday. Like I said, my heroes are writers. I, I do read quite, quite a bit these days. And, um, I think I'm fascinated by the, by the craft of, of forming a good story. And so... I'll wait until there is a story that becomes something that I can't not, you know, a book that is, is I think the Don Wall became something that I could not not climb, and I think a, a writing project is the same way. It has, to, it has to capture me in a way that there's no option, but I'm certainly open to that. Fantastic. And so now we have microphones on both aisles. Oh, we have a question right up here in the front. Uh, 
Okay, so the question was, um, after how many falls would we swap out to a new rope? Um, you know, I know the ropes say that you're only supposed to take like six UIAA rated falls on them. I would just wait until I could see the core. <laughs> but one time, one time I did take a rope apart, and you know, there's probably 100 strands of core material in there. And I took one strand, and I tied a foot loop in it, and I couldn't break it with my body weight, so it felt pretty strong. Pretty good about it, yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering, I know that you did a bunch of collaboration in writing with Kelly Cordes, and I'm just thinking about climbing partnerships and writing partnerships. If you could talk a little bit about that partnership with Kelly. Yeah, um, so Kelly was my um, main collaborator on this book. I think I refer to him as my writing doctor. I wanted the experience of writing a book, but I knew I didn't have the skills to make it as good as I wanted to in the end. So um, I basically just called up my next door neighbor, who so happened to be a really good writer, and one of my best friends. And so our process was, that, was such that I hired him to, to work on the book with me. We would go generally on ski tours together and talk structure and kind of overall ideas. Then I'd come back and I would crank out the chapters and then after I'd finished a chapter, I'd send it to him, and then he would help me kind of form and, and craft it in a way. And through this process, he became, you know, not only my writing doctor, but my personal therapist in a lot of ways. <laughs> and, um, you know, one of my very best friends. I was incredibly lucky. I think that our, that our working relationship was was one that is a little bit unique in the writing world. I didn't have any holdups to being a good author. Like, I was, I was a D English student <laughs> in high school, and so I knew the mechanics of writing were going to be quite tough for me. So I didn't, you know, I, th I felt like finding people to really help me through that part was, was necessary and a good thing. And so, um, yeah, Kelly, Kelly was, was, was really incredible. Yeah, thank you. So <clears throat> your kids are very involved in your life, it sounds like. So as a father, what do you think they are learning distinctly from you, from your example, from the lifestyle? And how would you feel about them doing what you and Alex Honnold have committed to? Yeah, that's such a great, great question. Um, you know, I hope that what they're learning, and probably people other than me can probably see the, the situation a little more clearly than I can as a father. Um, but what I want them to learn is this love of nature. Um, I want them to be a part of this very vibrant group of, of, um, of outdoor lovers. I mean, it's funny, I, on the way over here, I was listening to a, a radio show that was talking about how 80% of people uh, say that they're unhappy. And I'm like, in my community, I bet that's more like 10%. <laughs> and so it makes me feel like the community of climbers and outdoor lovers, like that is really a, that's a pretty magical, magic formula that I want to expose them to and, um, and show them because it is like the, the, the places that we go are inspiring and the, the you know, this sort of goal oriented lifestyle that climbing or skiing or all these things that we do formulates is pretty magical. And I want them to experience that. I don't want them to die, though, and uh, so I think I take the example of my father and try and do what he did, but dial it back just a little bit, because he did almost kill me several times when I was a <laughs> when I was a little kid, and so uh, you know my children are two and five right now, but I imagine as as the adventure, um, the intensity of the adventure increases, I will be as my father did talking a lot about the risk and the preparedness and the kind of, um, you know, cost. For, I mean, who knows? He's like, he'll, my, my kids will probably end up being chubby little tuba players or something, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Thank you for being here. How do you problem solve when you're climbing something and it's not going the way you think it should? I mean, that's, that's you know, there's certain things, you know, there's certain ways in life that, that sheer grit has allowed me to, you know, kind of excel at certain things. 
Um, but I would say if there's if there's one just God given thing that I've always had, it's this sort of this tenacity, this unbelievable optimism that what I'm doing is worth it, or that I will enjo- you know I enjoy it despite how how kind of painful it might be. And so that's what I do when when things get hard. I just go to this place of optimism and I focus on the on the growth and sort of the uh, the me- the mechanics and the methodical um, sort of nature of of just going out and grinding it out. Hi, uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are about um, how the process of filmmaking, what the impact it is on the folks that are climbing. I know that uh, you know. In the Don Wall, obviously, you had ropes and stuff, so maybe it wasn't quite the same as in the Alex Honnold, uh free solo movie, but it seems like when you've got filmmakers there that it does have some impact, and I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, that's, a, that's such a great question. It, it certainly has a lot of impact. Um, on the Don Wall, in some ways, it was a really good climb to film because we were climbing so darn slow, and you can... Um, you can fix ropes to the wall, which we did a lot of, and then the photographers can use those ropes to swing around and hang out with you. And um, so they were up there for parts of all seven years, and we became good friends with them. And in, in a way, it was really helpful because if it was just me, Ke- me and Kevin up there, we might have gotten tired of each other after a while. But it was me and Kevin and Brett and Josh Lowell, and so um, it really felt like a team. And um, you know, I. I loved that. I mean, they were they were almost my partners in, in a similar capacity that Kevin was. Um, and also, I think, you know, Kevin, like I said, he's he's like eight years younger than me. He's he was I was sort of a curmudgeon when it came to social media. Kevin totally embraced it. Um, I think having filmers and the and the idea of this becoming a film really was quite motivating to Kevin. Um, and actually helped him along. Like, I remember we spent about six months climbing on the wall together, just me and him, and he was, like, kind of timid at times, which, granted, you should be if you've never been that high off the ground. He, had, he was just a boulder, and then we went to the side of El Cap and we're climbing hard moves and taking big falls, like, you know, 3,000 feet off the ground. Um, but all of a sudden, one day, um, Black Diamond, who we were both sponsored by, sent a photographer out to take some photos for an ad, and Kevin became such a badass. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is really helpful. It was like a big jump. And then that helped him gain confidence and helped push, the f- push it forward. Um, at watching Alex get filmed was really, really interesting um, because this was a climb that he really, you know, there was a high chance that he was gonna die on film. And so watching Jimmy Chin kind of process that and figure out what that meant, it took an incredible amount of boldness and it took faith in Alex that he was going to make the right decision. And that decision being not that he was going to, dis- not that he was going to, well, the, deci- the right decision was that he was going to tell them that, he, you know, he, 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 he was going to climb based purely on his own internal wants and not at all based on the external pressures of making the film. And I do think Alex is one of the few people that could genuinely make that decision um, well. Do we have time for one more here? Here in the middle? Just a question about uh, (coughs) the human aging process catches up with all of us. When will it catch up with uh, climbers like yourself? Oh, it already has for me. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's funny. It depends on the style of climbing. I think um, it's funny. I was talking to one of the best sport climbers I know, this guy named John Cardwell, the other day, and he's I think he's like twenty seven years old, maybe. And I was like, Oh, do you have you had any uh, aspirations to um, to be in the Olympics? And he's like, I'm too old for that. And, um, so, you know, for that style of athlete, maybe you age out of it quite young, but for more adventurous styles of climbing, um, you know, experience is, is a huge part of it. And so you peak much later in life. Um, but I will say that I'm not looking to top the dawn wall in terms of, um, difficulty. So I do feel like I'm already on the downward spiral. <laughs> and then I think we have one more right here. 
young man. Can you just wait for the microphone for one second? Um, why haven't you climbed in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> That's fu it's funny that you mentioned that. I just uh, just committed to a trip to Australia this summer. In, uh, G in July and August, so I'll be there for a month. One of the places that's been on the top of my list for a long time. <laughs> okay, I think that does it. And um, thank you so much. Tommy will be signing books outside here. So if you can let him sneak through, uh, we'll be all set. <laughs>